Shi. Recorded live. Hello and welcome everybody. This is again Joggler66 from the YouTube channel Joggler66. Jörg Lissmann is my name. And I welcome you to another broadcast on Hour of the Truth. Today we have Thursday, the 9th of April in 2015. Finally, the new year has started even for us Bible-believing Christians because we do not celebrate the 1st of January as the start of the new year. Uh, I'm still waiting for my guest Tom Fress to show up. There has probably something delayed him to be on time here. I hope that he will join me later in the broadcast that we have figured out for today. But uh, before I will start with the new topic um, that we have watched for today out, as you could see in our invitation that was dealing with the subject um, the Antichrist thinks to change times and laws, I would like first to go back to some quotes of the signs of the times that I read at the last broadcast uh, on Hour of the Truth last week. And, um, you know, there were more, broad, more quotations on that email that I have here than the three or four that I read last week. So let me please just start with repeating the quotes that I read last week so that we get into the same sense right now. The quotes deal, of course, with the Catholic subversion of the United States of America as an example. And there you can see how the United States in the time has been infiltrated. And the first three quotes come all from the same book, from Charles Chiniqui. He was a Roman Catholic uh, more than 25 years within the Roman Catholic Church, and he lived from 1809 until the end of the 19th century, and wrote this book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome. And there are some very interesting quotes that will give you an idea how he, as a member of the Roman Catholic Church, of course, was already aware of the infiltration that the Roman Catholic Church was doing, uh, going to do uh, in the United States in the run of the time. And in the run of the time, let's say, that started at 1776 with uh, the founding of the United States and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, where you know that, um, at least that is my point of view, you can debate me on that, I have no problem with that, but I think that the first amendment that reads that um, there is freedom of religion is a point in the Constitution that left the door open for the Roman Catholics, who were forbidden in the time of the Protestant colonies before the founding of the United States. But with the acceptance of freedom of religion, they had their foot in the door to come into the United States. And by that, when you read this uh, wonderful book that um, Walt Stickel from Grand Design Exposed, who is also the host of this call, um, mentioned a few times from uh, John Ives, uh, Ives, I think it is, uh, The Ark and the Dove. Um, at that time, 1600, in the beginning of 1600s, there was, how many was it, Walt? One percentage of the American population was Catholic at that time, right? Yes, York. Um, this is, uh, one other thing I want to make clear here, I, I just, I'm just writing a, an introduction to a, a little booklet, and the booklet is called The Vatican Jesuit Global Conspiracy, and I was just writing about this this morning. Up until 1776, this is the missing key that, that they took away from Americans. Up until, up, until, in this, up until 1776, 99% of the population was Protestant, and less than 1% was Catholic. Now, the reason for it... With 1776, you see, that 99% did not consider Roman Catholicism Christianity. Because of the Royal Declaration in 1688, it's right in the Royal Declaration that can be read on my website, Grand Design Exposed. But the Protestants in England called Rome a superstitious and idolatrous religion. And so with 1776 and the freedom of religion, we became a universal government. Now that's not trying to run things down. We still had Protestant principles, understand. 
we, we got the Protestant principles with the Bill of Rights, and the truth of it is, the revolution probably would never have fired off if, I mean, they would have had some rebuttal if they hadn't give us the Bill of Rights. The people in the streets would have raised up, the 99%. But what we did get, but what we did get in 1776 was a universal government. In other words, any race, I mean, any religion could, co could come here and practice, and the government had no, uh, I can't quote you the First Amendment word for word, but uh, we're all familiar with the First Amendment and the freedom of religion. So, so what this caused, what this caused was a universal government. I say universal because I'm, I'm, I'm coming to a point. Now, everybody knows the word of what the word Catholic, the uh, uh, meaning of the word Catholic is also universal. Now, this is a hard pill to swallow, but on this broadcast, we don't have any <clears throat> sugar daddies. Nobody is supporting us, so we can say and we can speak the truth, you see. And so there's another th way that you can, what you can call this country. This country was Catholic from the beginning. And I used to blurt that out without giving a little bit of an introduction to what I'm saying. This is not saying that everything was terrible about the government. I mean, I'm just not anti-government. But the truth of it is, Washington, D.C. today has over 40 Catholic churches, has the biggest basilica, the biggest cathedral in North America. And there's 40 Catholic churches. And anybody with, uh, that understands images and look at, look at the images, you'll see, you'll see that, that Washington, D.C. is an image of the Vatican. Can I interfere right there? Yes, go ahead. That is a very interesting point that has come to me the last days when I thought about Revelation 13 and uh, verse 11 about the beast that coming out of the sea. We, as Protestants, of course, interpret the Bible, the King James, 11, uh, the King James from 1611, um, as God meant, meant it to be. And there is mentioning of the beast that is coming out of the sea. And we all know that is the Vatican. And the Vatican sits in Rome. And Rome, by this, is identified as the beast out of the sea, right? We don't take Ital Italy for that, because Rome is seated in Italy, but Rome has nothing to do with Italy at that. I mean, it's just the, uh, the ruling class over there in Rome, and uh, most certainly the Vatican, that is exactly the beast that comes out of the sea. And Rome, the Vatican, the church, and the church-state combination is the, uh, <clears throat> the, the little horn that Daniel meant in his prophecy. So now when we say the, uh, the United States of America is the second beast coming out of the earth, we should maybe even uh, constrain that not to the United States of America in itself, but to Washington in itself. Washington, D.C., District of Columbia, is a part, is a city in itself that does not make any part of the United States. And that would be a good explanation of the beast that rising out of the earth, because that was an unpopulated area. Also, we know when we study history that what today we call Washington, that place first was called Rome, and the river running through it was called the Tiber, the same river as in Rome. And that would make a perfect image of the first beast. What's your idea to that thinking, Walt? Well, Washington, D.C. <clears throat> is, like you said, it's a country within a country, just like the Vatican. And London is the military arm. I mean, no, Lon me. London, London is, the is the financial arm, and the Vatican is the military arm. No, the spiritual arm. <laughs> and Washington. Excuse me. Excuse me. I got. That. Excuse me. Yes. Yes. You know. And and Washington is is the military. 
and uh, it 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 is very revealing uh, when you uh, understand that Daniel Carroll is the one that gave the land where the capital was built. Uh, freedom that sits on top of the capital was designed by a man named Crawford. It's up there on my webpage. It's in the, in the chapter on um, Tupper Saucy's chapter 22, I believe, of um, Immaculate Conception. And then we have the uh, inside after it was built, and also the capital, when they put freedom on top of the capital, this is, when I read this, when I was doing this webpage on Tupper Saucy's book, I almost fell out of the chair. On December 2nd, 1863, they put, in, they, in, in those days, they didn't have helicopters, so it, it took three lifts to get uh, freedom on top of the Capitol. Now, it was, uh, it was uh, the, the mold was made in Rome, and then it's come over here, and it was cast here. Okay. But, on December 2nd, 1863, we're in the middle of the Civil War. And why? And they give a 47 gun salute. The 47 gun salute was for John Carroll, who had, who had uh, passed away 47 years prior. So, and then when you go inside the Capitol, you know. It it you know it looks like Saint Peter. I mean, even on the on um, um, the Washington tourist uh, pamphlet, there's a it says right on their little pamphlet, you know, the Washington Capitol. It looks like Saint Peter. <laughs> well, it, there's a reason why it looks like Saint Peter because because <laughs> because the the because uh, not only the painter the painter. I can't pronounce his name. He's Italian. If you know, you can say it. But he's the one that uh, painted the inside, the apothe apotheosis. And they deified Washington in the Capitol, in the, up in the dome. So it's got the earmarkings of Rome all over Washington, D.C., okay? And, you know... It, it it is part of it. In, in other words, in, in the more the more idolatrous a country gets, superstitious and idolatrous, you get the more crime and morals deteriorate. I mean, and you can this is very evident in Roman Catholic countries. You have po poverty. There's a reason why the Mexicans come north. It's, you know, there's there's a reason for it. You know, and and the one one of the reasons is 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 is, Ro, is uh, Mexico is 95 percent Catholic. And so, anyway, I I I don't. It, it's getting back to what I've I, I give you some pieces of the puzzle. This country is a universal government. Okay, it's a universal government. And, and you, the pieces of the puzzle are up in Grand Design Exposed. It, it wasn't until about six, seven months ago that I realized uh, what I had put up there. The pieces, I don't tell you, I don't put the pieces together. But you can get the idea when you understand, like one of the pieces of the puzzle is 99% were Protestant and less than 1% were Catholic. You can you you can put you I don't have to tell you and put the pieces together. What was the smallest denomination in 1776 and was illegal is now the largest denomination in America. They own more property than any. They're the biggest property owner in this country because the federal government is the papacy. You see, I'm not throwing stones here. We're not throwing stones. We're talking about pieces of the puzzle and who really controls the American government. 
It's Rome. This is a Roman Catholic government. Through Georgetown University. And it is ruled from Georgetown University. That's also a subject where I want to make another broadcast on, on Georgetown University, and put some videos in there that I have from the Internet, explaining who is all in there and who comes all out of there. Uh, it's not only actors, and it's a lot of politicians, and you have to know all the laws concerning the United States of America today are written in uh, Georgetown University, which is a Jesuit university that was founded by, if I'm not mistaken, Charles Carroll. John Carroll. Uh, John Carroll, yeah, one of the Carroll brothers. It's always one of the three, uh, uh, John, Charles, or Daniel. <laughs> they all three were, were Jesuits, and they all three were very much involved in the founding of the United States of America. And when you know this, and uh, therefore, of course, you have to li do a little bit reading in a book like Rulers of Evil from Tapasosi, because all the other people do not mention very much the carols. Uh, you can ask yourself why, but uh, when you the deeper you study it, then you see what their agenda is, of course. But Tapasosi made it very clear that the Carol brothers, all three of them, who went up to 16 years studying in what today is Belgium, here in Bruges and other Jesuit universities in Europe, in Paris, and uh, Liège, and Bruges, in Flanders, where I live. I don't live in Bruges, but I live in Flanders, in another part. Um, and they were Jesuit educated up to 16 years, and they were very, very heavy involved in the founding of the United States of America. So how could that be that these three Jesuits, Jesuits who are the result of the Counter-Reformation, and determined to extirpate all Protestants from the earth, were so much involved in the founding of a so-called Protestant country. Just ask yourself these questions and then start your own research on that, and then you will see that you have been lied to most of the time of your life. And when Walt says today we have a Catholic government in the United States of America, I even go further and say today, even in the Senate, you have a Catholic majority, and not only there, also in the population you have a Catholic majority, because it's about 25% of the American population that is officially Roman Catholic. But you have to count all the Protestants who, and that leads us back to the other broadcast that we did, that you probably remember here on the Hour of the Truth, we we're talking about the Catholic Lutheran Accord, the joint declaration of justification that the Roman Catholic Church signed with the World Lutheran Federation in 1999 as a result of the ecumenical movement that started in 1962 to 1965 with Vatican II, where the, where the Roman Catholic Church changed their policy and embraced the enemy and infiltrated the enemy instead of openly fighting them. That was the whole idea of the ecumenical movement. And when you see that with this Catholic Lutheran Accord, all the Lutherans, and I think I read that in one of the parts, how many that were, I think it's about 20 million people who are organized in the, uh, in the Lutheran uh, Church in the United States of America, and you take all the other so-called Protestant denominations, and you count them all together, and they are all infiltrated by the Roman Catholic Church, by the Jesuits, and by that have given up their protest. When you count all these people together with the Catholics, then the United States of America has one of the vast majorities of Catholic-led denominations, Catholic-led churches in the world. How about and, that, Walt? Yes, and you can do a Google search on the 10 mega churches. Just put in 10 mega churches, and you will come across the 10 mega churches. And it's, it is, the video was put together by atheists. But those 10 mega churches are Catholic. They're not. They're not Protestant. And in the proof, the piece of the puzzle that proves 
that America is Catholic is the fact that we have the Pope, a Jesuit Pope, coming to visit America on September 24th, 2015. A Jesuit, because the same, another word for Jesuit, they were formed in 1534 to counter the Reformation. Now, there's not enough, there isn't any Protestants. The reason why they can put a Jesuit in the Vatican and then bring the Jesuit over here, the Jesuit Pope, and let him speak to a joint session of Congress is because nobody has any history. He's Christian. No, on September 24th, 2015, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, that every one of the reformers identified as identified, such. all of a sudden, the world doesn't know. Doesn't, they've just taken that part they haven't rewritten history in some aspects they'd have, but they haven't had to rewrite it. They've just taken it away. And again, I want to emphasize this. This is what happened in 1776. 99% of the people in the colonies realized, well, they knew that they were coming. They came over here for religious freedom. Now, yeah. you know, people, people right now will, will hit me. They will, they will say, well, oh, you know, they, listen, the Protestants in those 13 colonies, they had their problems, okay? But in one thing they were united in. That's the reason they would not allow Roman Catholics to in government. Now, I've had an opportunity to, you know, when I was a... <clears throat> On another broadcast, I mean, this I have I know a person that's got a copy of the some of the original constitution of the states, and every one of those states had a stipulation in there that you could not be Catholic, you had to be Protestant to hold office. Now, this is now I, I, I want to give a big piece of the puzzle here. This is the biggest piece of the puzzle that I've found. This is the biggest historical find. This is not Walt Stickle. This, I have no agenda that I'm trying to put across. I'm giving you a piece of the puzzle, and that is the Royal Declaration. Back in the 1600s, up until 1776, matter of fact, this this can be found in the 1912 Catholic Encyclopedia. But they said this, the Declaration of, of, of Royal Declaration, you know, I've mentioned this before, but it can't be said enough. How many people have stopped? And I'm telling you, the people that listen to this tape, the people that listen to this tape for the first time, they've, they've never heard of the Royal Declaration. How do I know this? I know a man, John Daniels, who wrote the book, The Grand Design Exposed. He researched for 25 years before he, he wrote his book. And after he wrote his book, he found the Royal Declaration. Now, you're going to say, people are saying, well, well, what's Walt talking about? What is the Royal Declaration? After the Glorious Revolution in 1688, and James II, you know, had married a Catholic, and he was, he was doing the same thing that his father, Charles I, was doing. England, they got so upset that the king, the Glorious Revolution, they didn't even fire a bullet. The king got on a boat and went to France. The king did. Now, well, you say, well, why did he do that? Because his daddy lost his head for, the, for, do, for, for doing the same thing that he was doing in the, English, in the English Civil War with Oliver Cromwell and his dad, Charles I. So now, where does this royal declaration come in? 
they brought William Penn and Mary from France. They were descended. They were Protestants. And they took over the throne. And, and James II, he went across the channel. Now, why? It, now, after this, they wrote the Royal Declaration, and here it is. When a king or queen is to be sworn in, she had to say this oath. I hereby, by the grace of God, King or Queen of England, Scotland and Ireland, defender of the faith, do solemnly and sincerely in the presence of God profess, testify, and declare that I do believe that in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper there is not any transubstantiation of the elements of bread and wine in the body and blood of Christ. Wow. At or after the concentration, concentration thereof by any person whatsoever, and the invocation or ador- adoration of the Virgin Mary or any other saint and the sacrifice of the Mass, as they are now used in the Church of Rome, are superstitious and idolatrous. And I do solemnly, in the presence of God, profess, testify, and declare that I do make this declaration and every part thereof in the plain and ordinary sense of the words read unto me, as they are commonly understand, understood by English Protestants, without any evasion, equivocation, or mental reservation whatsoever, and without any dispensation already granted to me by the Pope, or any other authority of persons whatsoever, or without any hope of any such dispensation from any person or authority whatsoever, or without thinking that I am or can be acquitted before God or man, or absolved of this declaration of any part thereof, although the Pope or, or any other person or persons or power whatsoever shall dispense with or annul the same or declare that it was null and void from the beginning. Now, people, that is a Protestant government. What does that mean? They didn't want the cookie. You're not going to eat the cookie, and you're not going to worship idols. And with the Declaration of Independence in 1776, all of that went by the wayside. What did what did the Protestants gain in the American Revolution? They didn't. 1776 was the birth of, ec- of the ecumenical movement, because the because Rome taught toleration, and so for the first time, I said this the other day. I read this to a friend of mine. And he said right away, he said, well, Walt, how long did they say that up to? They said that up to 1910. That old, in a 1910, in a 1910, they, 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 they shortened it. But even the short one was, I do solemnly and since, now this is what the, this is what Elizabeth II had to say when she became queen 60 years ago. I do solemnly and sincerely in the presence of God professed testify and declare that I am a faithful protestant and that I will, according to the true intent of the enactments to secure the protestant succession to the throne of my realm, uphold and maintain such enactments to the best of my power. Of course, we know with history today, in 2015, that Rome is at the top. And all you have to do to understand who rules is put in Queen Elizabeth, Pope, and Google, and it hit images. Put in the Chancellor uh, uh, of Germany, the Prime Minister of uh, put the Prime Minister of Canada, Pope, and hit enter, and you'll see pictures. They've all they've all been been to Rome and kissed the ring. So 
you know, I think you were getting ready to read Charles Chenequay, uh what he what he said that had had planned, and Charles Chenequay has been called uh, the the Martin Luther of the United States. Do you have do you have that some of his uh, what he said, uh, York? Yeah, I have some of his quotes here. I just uh... I just thought, well, why haven't you come up with that before? This royal declaration is something very interesting that most of the people, <laughs> I think at least 90% <laughs> or even more, even of the people who listen regularly to our broadcasts, uh, have never heard of. And, well, um, that's, let me, that's, let that's let me just problem. comment on that again, because listen, listen, when you have been lied to all your life, you know, it's it, it's harder to get rid of the misinformation and put in something. You know, you, it, you know, see, people have a preconceived idea. You know, they, the Americans have a preconceived preconceived idea that America was founded because of taxes. See, it, it, uh, it, you know, tea and taxes. No, the American Revolution was was to 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 give was to give Catholics the freedom of religion and civil rights in America. That's what the American Revolution was all about. And you have so many armies of people. You have armies like the David Bartons, and then, then you have the Eric Phelps. People that, that, like Eric Phelps has got an 896-page book. And he is a walking cyclopedia, if you've ever heard him interviewed. But what does he do? He discredits. He discredits the Protestants. Now you say, well, how, did he, how does he do that? He left out the carols in his book. He leaves out the carols. Do you think that that was by an accident? Do you think that David Barton, I mean, David Barton does mention one time the, the Carol, the Charles Carroll on, on, on his website. It's mentioned. But, 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 and even Chris Pinto, you've heard of the hidden faith of the founding fathers? It was a universal government. The hidden faith of the founding fathers was Romanism. Even Chris Pinto, he's a terrific, terrific. His documentaries are great. But he's a former Catholic and he's a futurist. He's, he cannot say, he can only go so far with the Pope. He can only expose Rome so far. But what's the difference between the hour of the truth and Chris Pinto? We can go. We don't have any sugar daddies. I can say. I can say. Uh, there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. And it ain't the Pope. So I can say, and so so I could even take you further. The for the forward. And their own, you know how I understand this and what has been bogging me down? I wake up mornings and say, is this important? Yes, it is. If you do a Google search on Charles Carroll, you're going to find out that he, he, he was the only Catholic signer of the Declaration of Independence. He financed the American Revolution. He helped finance it. And he was a neighbor to George Washington. Now, now, and he was the biggest slave owner in the colonies. Washington, D.C. was the trading capital, the, the, the training center of slavery. So, you know, so 
these people are very, very important, and they are, they've been left out of history for a reason. If people understood the, the Catholic influence, the Roman influence of the American Revolution, they had to cover it up. You can talk about you can talk about anything you want to talk about. Give you an example, Alex Jones. He'll talk for three hours a day He's on chemtrails, which is fine. Vaccines, the elitists, the globalists. You know, for three hours a day. That's sixty hours a month. And he won't mention the Vatican once. Who are the globalists? What organization has a global network? It's it's Rome. Any, anyway, we got we um, we you got you got a comment, uh, York? I I see Tom and I'm going to invite him in. Yeah, I, do I have a comment? That, that's a very interesting question. I mean, you speak right, of my, uh, right out of my heart when you say all these things. And I think this is very important because a lot of our listeners will think that we are just going around here bashing America, bashing America. But that's what I wanted to make clear in my introduction when I said this image of the beast and this uh, second beast coming out of the earth. You don't have to identify that with the United States of America, but you can identify that as Washington, D.C., which makes actually more sense because even this, like the Vatican, is not part of the country that it is in. Like the Vatican is no part of Italy, Washington, D.C. is no part of the United States. And as we all know, in the Bible, uh, a beast is conformed to a government or a king, a, a political power, the political power is there in Washington, D.C. I mean, this was even something that I asked myself more than 20 years ago when I uh, had, had no, no idea of all the things that I, uh, that I know now. Why is it called Washington, D.C.? Why is it District of Columbia? What does that stand for? Is that just another state or what is it? And because of this, um, discussion that was going on on some other videos of mine where there was said the second beast is not the United States of America I, I thought okay maybe it's not the United States of America but what if it is Washington and you, then you come up here and telling about all these uh, you know setting freedom on top of the capital and the painting uh, that deifies Washington in there I knew about that because I also saw that uh, documentary uh, from Chris Pinto where that is in of course and then it makes even more sense to say, yes, this second beast, and that is the image, that is Washington. That doesn't have to be the United States of America. In the United States of America, all the people living there are just betrayed, as all the other people all around the world are constantly betrayed and fooled and taken by their nose like cattle when you leave them to the slaughter place. And that's exactly what they do with us. So I thought that would be, may, maybe be an interesting viewpoint to say, yeah, the second beast is Washington. And that would be absolutely uh, make sense also when you see uh, this book, Washington in the Lab of Rome. And when you look at the mirror, uh, uh, when you look at the mirror image, when you, when you look at the um, uh, St. Peter's Basilica and then you look at the Capitol and you see the resemblance of that, then it also makes absolutely sense that that is just a mirror. I don't know, Tom didn't follow us that much in the discussion here, but uh, maybe he has some uh, remarks on that that we are just, uh, just talking about. And otherwise, Walt, uh, you can still go on with your explanation because I'm really fascinated by what, what, what you say today. I only ask myself, why haven't you said that before, man? <laughs> why have you holding, been holding back? <clears throat> Ale, come on, Tom, very welcome to our broadcast tonight. Hi, Yerk, and uh, my apologies to your listeners for my lateness, but uh, I heard you mention the book, the title of the book, Washington in the Lap of Rome, and I highly recommend that book for people who are uh, researching this, uh, this unholy alliance uh, between the government of the United States and the Vatican. And uh, it just corroborates uh, 
other more recently published books, uh, one in particular of which I have right here on my bench, uh, Global Vatican. And uh, this book was written by a U.S. ambassador to the Holy See, the not-so-Holy See, and his name is Francis Rooney. And for those who are doubtful about the influence that the Vatican has over U.S. foreign and domestic policy, I highly recommend this book. And I thank uh, uh, Brother Walt for sending this book to me. I read it. I couldn't hardly put it down, and it confirmed all my suspicions. And this straight from a Roman Catholic, an admitted, a professed Roman Catholic who was made U.S. ambassador to the Holy See. Again, his name is Francis Rooney, and the title of the book is The Global Vatican. And it confirms uh, what has been made vividly obvious to me, that the, the, the government of Washington, D.C. is simply a vassal, a vassal of the papacy. And uh, I suspect also other governments of the world, and if I am to believe what the Bible says, that the whole world wonders after the beast, I have to believe that the Vatican's foreign and domestic policies uh, are shared by the other governments of the world as well. And uh, uh, thanks for inviting me on board today, and my again, my apologies for my lateness. Oh, that's all right, Tom. Uh, always something can come uh, come between your plans. Uh, I have no problem with that. And uh, when you later will listen to the broadcast, then you will see that Walt and I had the heck of a time here. And uh, Walt all of a sudden found back his speech that I missed so much of the time because <laughs> he was being so quiet the last month. And I love it that he's back and his explanation that just what he did, giving us of the uh, royal declaration and uh, and all the things how they how they come together was very enlightening today to me at least. So, Walt, is there something that you want to say to close that before we go on reading the quotes here from Charles Chinicky? Well, I can, all I can say is that uh, Tom and I have done a broadcast on the Royal Declaration, and sometimes I think sometimes we mention sometimes and we're a little shy on repeating it, but the truth of it is, uh, uh, the truth of it is that people know about the Royal Declaration. 99% of them have, gone, have, have heard it on, the, uh, on a broadcast from uh, Tom and I, Because it's just, I'm not trying to pound our chest, but this is hidden. People, like I told you earlier before, a man that researched the book for 25 years, and he was just, happened to be going through the 1912 encyclopedia, and he found the Royal Declaration. You see, the Royal Declaration says this, that the Protest, that the English that England is the only country that ever had a protestant government. It would not allow the eating of the cookie and the, and the adoration of Mary. The king had to vocally say this before, he, before they started their reign. And it goes back to what I said earlier. It's painful. It's painful to admit, and I remember... I remember when John Daniels years ago saying, saying, well, the United States was Catholic from the beginning. Well, I stiffened up like a, like, like anybody. I, mean, I was an American, and I, and I just couldn't see that we were Catholic from the very beginning. But what I did not, was not able to see, is, is that we, we, what happened in 1776 was a universal government. See, it's a universal government. This is not trying to, you know, be anti-American. We're being histo we're giving pieces of the puzzle. We're talking facts. Evidence does matter. Yes, we got Protestant principles, but there is nothing in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights that is Protestant. That's but correct. The, but the Royal Declaration. 
those 200 years prior to 1776 have had to be buried. I used to call this when people, when I was out in the truck doing some reading and stuff, I would say this. The 200 years prior to 1776 to me is like a black hole. I knew nothing about it. It's not an accident. It's not an accident. Well, it's, it's the same over here in Europe, you know. We are taught that uh, Columbus discovered the New World in 1492, and in 1776, the United States of America was founded, and the years in between, nobody tells about that. <laughs> nobody. Nobody speaks about that. That is not taught in any school. There are not available any books that, uh, that you are told to read about that, to get any of that history. And, of course, there is no mentioning of Protestant or Catholic or any kind of religion anyway. No. Because, you know, religion, that is, that is all, that is, that, is not, that is not interesting, you know. It is just about what man did at that time, you know. Humanism, the upcoming humanism and, and all that. And uh, like uh, Thomas Paine, who, who wrote the book, um, The Age of Reason, these things come up. But religion... Is always kept away. And, and, and to understand the hidden faith of the founding fathers was universalism. And we had three Jesuit, Jesuit founders. Now, Tom was reading R.W. Thompson, Thompson's The Footprints of the Jesuits. And I heard a broadcast, and he was reading along, and it came right off the top of his head. I know it did. All of a sudden, he said, "You know, we all we all know that John Carroll was a was a was a Jesuit, had twenty six years of education, but Daniel and Charles were both sent overseas, and they're all three Jesuits." I mean, I almost fell out of my chair when Tom said that on that broadcast that day. We had three Jesuit. We had three Jesuit founding fathers, and nobody even knows what a Jesuit is. This, this is how they have turned things around. They did it through education. And you know, everybody's heard this. It only takes one generation. Well, man, they've, we're not talking about one generation they are, listen, listen, uh, the United States, by 1850, the smallest denomination be, became the largest by 1850. And by the Civil War, by the Civil War... You're, 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 saying, you're saying the smallest denomination, I, I take it you're suggesting that the smallest denomination was the Roman Catholic Church. Right. Okay, yeah. less than 1% of the... A population was uh, Roman Catholic at that time. Yes, and and by 1850 they became the largest. They were the largest by eight. They were the largest even before the Civil War. And how did they do all, it? First, they did. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, it's you know I hate to interrupt somebody when they're when they're talking. I don't want to disrupt your your line of thinking. But we've used now three or four times the word denomination to describe the Roman Catholic Church, and I know you know this, Walt, and so do you, Yerk, but for the listeners, we want to make clear, we don't regard the Roman Catholic Church a denomination of anything holy, okay? It's not a denomination of Christ's church. It is the synagogue of Satan. It is the, the little horn, the beast that rules over the kings of the earth. And uh, uh, we get caught once in a while using terms that everyone else uses to describe the Roman Catholic Church. And, and, and all of Christianity today just regards the Roman Catholic Church as just another denomination of Christianity. It, 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 look, there is no division in God's house. God never intended for there to be division in his house. There should be no such a word in our vocabulary as denomination and again i know walt knows this and so does jerk that's a good point but when we're when we're when we're discussing these things in front of a listening audience we need to make clear that though we may use that term because it's so widely used to describe the roman catholic church 
we personally, each and every one of us, do not agree that the Roman Catholic Church is any denomination of Christianity. Absolutely is, right. It I is just that want our which listeners to five, understand. Yeah, we yes, just want indeed. our listeners to understand the the, the yes. terms that we are speaking. Point well made. <clears throat> that is exactly. That is exactly. And thanks, Tom. Yeah, Tom, that was um, a very important point that you made there. But, uh, you know, sometimes we have to speak in the plain words that also the people understand who are not that far in the studies like you are and uh, Walt is and uh, even I am sometimes. So by using that word denomination, of course, we don't want to bring any disgrace to the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, let, let's speak out clearly here from, from, from my point of view right now. And I speak in Walt's name and I speak in Tom's name, as you've just heard. But it's sometimes just important to use these kind of words to make sure to everybody that we un that we understand each other and that we speak actually of the same thing, just actually in the wrong terms. Then I I, I just want to go back uh, something uh, you said, Walt, about uh, they have taken history out of uh, out of the out of the studies, out of the colleges, out of the schools. And here again, I want to refer to the wonderful book that Tapa Saucy wrote, The Rulers of Evil, in page 37, and, uh, 73 and 74. And this quote is, and you probably know that already, but I'm going to quote it anyway. Most colleges today are turning out graduates who have studied little or no history. In 1914, 90% of America's elite colleges required history. In 1939, that's a generation later, between 1914 and 1939, you have 25 years, that's a generation. And again, 1964, again, one generation later, more than 50% did, opposite to the 90% in 1914. By 1996, and that's the time that he wrote the book, only one of the 50 best schools offered a required history course. The day is approaching, perhaps. He's very... <laughs> careful using his words, when the only historians will be amateurs who study history as self-help, who examine, who, who examine the past in order to make sense of the present and not to be caught unprepared by the future, end quote. And Walt, you made a very interesting point. It only takes one generation. And there's another quote, I don't know who it says, but he said that Every generation, again and again and again, has to defend their freedom. Freedom that this generation achieved does not last the generation after that automatically if it is not taught to the next generation what this freedom stands for. And when you look at the numbers, the years that Tapa Saucy mentioned here in this book, 1914, 1939, and 1964, that equals every time a 25-year gap. And a human generation is generally considered to be 25 to 30 years. What do you think will happen in the future 25 years after 9-11? Interesting question, I think. Anyway... Is there something uh, you two want to share with me here on this uh, quote that I just read? Well, certainly, uh, those who are not educated in history are simply doomed to repeat that history. And I'm, I'm afraid, uh, and I don't want to seem to be a fear monger. I'm a realist, and my realism is based on real history and real scripture. We're headed for a repeat of the past. Look, in this country, few people can tell you what Protestantism means. Protestantism is a protest against the Antichrist. It, it is a, it, it's, it's a Christian body. It is Christ's body. We preach Christ and him crucified, but we also denounce Antichrist. The Protestant Reformation was so-called because it was a protest against the papacy. 
after the Bible was printed for the first time in the languages of the people so that they could read it for themselves, the unanimous conclusion was that the prophecies uh, regarding the little horn of Daniel, the man of sin, the son of perdition, and the Antichrist were all speaking of none else but the papacy. That was the unanimous deci- that was the unanimous consent consensus among the Protestants, and they protested. They came out of the Roman Catholic Church. We we in the in, in Christianity, you know, the Bible says those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But who in this country is persecuted for their Christian faith? We live in peace. <clears throat> We simply have forgotten that Christ has an enemy who confronted him right after his baptism in the river by John when he was 40 days tempted in the wilderness. He was, he was tempted by the tempter. Christ has an enemy, and his enemy is manifest in the world today by the man of sin, and has been ever since the third century. And we've forgotten, as Protestants, we have forgotten who that enemy is. We've not been told who that enemy is, either in our churches or in our schools. And that's how they blinded us. No one, very few can tell you that Rome pursued Bible believers, Bible readers, and Bible believers to their deaths, to pursued them without mercy, without relent, for 605 consecutive years. Pope after pope after pope, 83 of them in succession over those 605 years, persecuted God's people with more vigor, more hatred, more brutality, more torture than the pagan Caesars of the first century Rome ever thought of. That's what's missing from our history. That's what's missing out of our schools. That's what's missing out of our churches. And because we're unaware of this history, because we're unaware of our Protestant heritage, history is going to repeat itself in this country Now, if you look at what has transpired since Vatican Council II, when the papacy referred to us not as Christians, but as separated brethren. Separated from what? Separated from the synagogue of Satan, the Roman Catholic Church. They didn't even bother to regard us as fellow Christians. No, we were separated brethren. See, in their mind, we are all apostates. We are all aggressors against what they call the one holy apostolic church. The one holy Roman Catholic and apostolic church outside of which there is no salvation. And Vatican Council II was literally an ultimatum to Protestants. Now that you no longer believe that the papacy throughout all of its history is the Antichrist, is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, the biblical and historical and prophetic Antichrist, the reason you protested in the first place the reason you left the one holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, now that you no longer believe that the Pope is the Antichrist, the papacy is the Antichrist, and you believe he's a single individual that comes at the end of time, that makes a peace treaty with Israel, and then after three and a half years breaks that treaty and causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease, which is exactly what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, confirmed a covenant with many for one week, seven years, the 70th week. And in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. How? 
by giving up his own life, becoming the lamb for you and me and the whole world. And God confirmed that by ripping the veil of the temple from top to bottom. That ended animal sacrifice. The priest literally can't do the the, the annual atonement for Israel with that veil lying open. It was Jesus that fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. But we've been taught for, and you were talking about generations, it only takes one generation. Well, it's been about four generations since they've started teaching this futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, gotten everybody, every Protestant eye away from the papacy and all of its history and put it on one single individual. And so Rome's ultimatum is, now you believe in futurism, you believe in this future Antichrist, I am exonerated. And all the popes before me are exonerated. And that means the Protestant Reformation was a grievous assault against the legitimate throne of Almighty God, the Holy See of Rome, the papacy. And you either come back to the Roman Catholic Church, and you undo all the damage that you did at the Protestant Reformation, which was liberating all the land. Remember, the papacy controlled at least a third of the tillable land of Europe. It, was, it belonged to the papacy because Roman Catholics, in order to, to uh, make atonement for their sins, gave their land, willed their land to the papacy as gifts. This was indulgences, see? That's how they appease the wrath of the Pope if they committed a sin. They literally bought their way to heaven through these gifts of land and property to the papacy. And that's why the papacy literally controlled Europe, because it controlled all the land and all the wealth. But the Protestant Reformation, when it came and declared the papacy was the Antichrist, then they realized the land has no legitimate purpose in the hands of the Pope. That land was given to God's people to sustain them. And they literally liberated all that land from papal control by throwing off, throwing off all of their papal governments. And they replaced them with elected governments. Elected governments that were bound to preserve the God-given rights of the people, which the papacy had taken away, and liberated the land. The land now designated as belonging to the papacy, which was farmed by serfs who were just literally slaves for the Vatican, the land was liberated and given back to the nations, given back to the people, and it was parceled out. People became landowners again. See, they liberated all of Europe. They freed up the land. All of a sudden, the nations could benefit from their own labor. They prospered. They prospered. Look at what liberty was brought by the Bible in all of Europe because they read it for themselves. The conclusion was unanimous. The papacy rules over all the kings of the earth. The Antichrist rules all over the kings of the earth. And they and the papacy owns the ground. We're literally slaves for this man of sin, this son of perdition. And so it became a matter of conscience to overthrow their governments who received their crowns directly from the papacy. They served the papacy, and they ruled over the people with a rod of iron, a rod of Roman iron. And all of a sudden, they had wealth. They had freedom. They could speak and not worry about being thrown into the Inquisition and tortured. They could criticize both the Pope and the King. For the first time in their lives, they had liberty to expose the diabolical relationship between the papacy, the king of kings, and the king of their country. And when the people became aware of this, they liberated themselves. They overthrew their papal kingdoms. They liberated the land. They parceled out the land to the people. They became industrious. They had, to, they had wealth with which to do. 
For the first time in history, since the rise of the papacy, the people knew what it was to enjoy the liberty whereby Christ hath made us free. But because now we believe in a future Antichrist, this tyrant along the Tiber is no longer regarded as the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. And ever since the rise of futurism that is taught in all the churches today, Rome says the Protestant Reformation is over. The process you, you, is over. As, you killed uh, it yourself. You believed in a future Antichrist. You've exonerated me and all my predecessors. And now you have to restore all that land. You have to restore everything that the papacy lost because of the Protestant Reformation. You have to restore my power, my influence, my control, and you have to submit to my divine, spiritual, and temporal authority. That is the New World Order, folks. You hear all this talk about the New World Order, and all the blame goes to the so-called Illuminati and all these other things. Oh, how fortunate for the papacy. But the New World Order is not new at all. It's simply the restoration of the Old World Order, which we should all be intimately familiar with, but no, they took it out of the schools, they took it out of the churches, they're not allowed to talk about it on, on the threat of being called a Catholic basher, or being called a religious bigot, or being called any name in the book, a domestic terrorist, they're going to call us anything they can to demonize us. Why? Because they are so close to restoring the papacy's global power that they will not tolerate any opposition. You hear, you know, this is why in the United States of America, there's no religious persecution against Protestants. Protestants don't know what religious persecution is. Why? Because they don't know anything about Protestantism. They don't protest God's enemy, the man of sin. The Protestants of Europe, before they liberated themselves, were persecuted from cradle to grave. And by the way, that persecution was so effective that there was little time between the cradle and the grave for them. They were forced to fight the papacy's crusades. They were forced to literally live under papal control, the control of the man of sin. Why have they taken this away? Why? Because they're going to restore that order. And they call it new, just to throw off any suspicion that it's not new at all. It's as old as Rome itself. It's as old as the Antichrist itself. Do you see what this has done to Protestantism? If a protester no longer protests, what is he? What right does he have to call himself a Protestant if he no longer protests, if he doesn't even know what to protest against? If he lives in peace with his antichrist neighbor? Who will stand up for me in the evil day? <clears throat> There's nobody standing up for Christ today against Antichrist. There's no persecution, but the Bible says all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And I'll tell you one thing. If you put on the robe of righteousness and cover yourself in the blood of Jesus and get on your battle horse and proclaim a war against the man of sin, the son of perdition, the tempter who faced Jesus right after his baptism, the one who rules over the kings of the earth, the one who would enslave us all just like Pharaoh in Egypt, you will suffer persecution. But it's much easier to leave believe a lie than to believe the truth and suffer persecution. And that's the problem. No one's willing to suffer for Christ's name. 
No one's willing to fight against the man of sin. The Antichrist of the Bible, the Protestant reformers were right. Their wisdom was based on the Scripture, and it was confirmed in their history. No one needed to ask the question, who is the Antichrist? They all knew. And I know, and so does Walt, and so does Yerk. Will you join us? Will you join us in the war? A war that was started in heaven? A war that will not end until he is bound in chains and cast into the bottomless pit by the Lamb who died for us? You know, this cushy, comfy, escapist Christianity that we so much enjoy is a lie. Deception. Now Christianity has no power. It's lethargic. It has atrophied into just a social club, which could hardly crack a Bible and get anything out of it. We desperately need to restore our knowledge and wisdom from the Scriptures, and we need to become familiar with the history that confirms those Scriptures, those prophecies. And if we don't, listen, let me just put it to you this way. Nowhere is it more evident that ignorance is not bliss than for Protestants to forget who they protested. History is about to repeat itself. Religious persecution, government-sponsored religious persecution is about to take place. Now, it will take place under any other name but religious persecution. See, Rome's put on the face that she is compatible with all religions now. So no one can believe that when the persecution starts in this country that the papacy has anything to do with it. But if history is any indication, you've you've heard the names of these authors that we've mentioned already previously. Do you know what the unanimous warning from them was? If Protestants ever forget their Protestant heritage, they will be enslaved once again, tortured once again, persecuted once again. And that's just exactly what's going to happen. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. Um, I just want to try to uh, make a bridge to our (laughs) broadcast that we were uh, we were starting today after all that you have said, and I think one quote from John Wycliffe, who lived before the time of 1776, um, was very interesting because he said, the Bible is the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And as we all know through earlier broadcasts that we did, like the externalization of the hierarchy, where the first point was, to take God out of the living, uh, out of the daily life of the people, and starting with taking out the morning prayer in the school system in 1963, um, the founding of the United States of America was a government for the people, by the people, and of the people. Exactly that what John Wycliffe said. But John Wycliffe said the Bible is the government of the people by the people and for the people. So when you take the Bible out of the equation, when you take the Bible out of the founding of the United States of America, what do you have left? A secular government, a humanistic government, a government that you can now see when you put your eyes on Washington, D.C., on that satanic city, which is, which is satanic to the core, even in the layout of the streets and everything else. Tom, you wanted to say something to that. I just wanted to reiterate what you were saying. You just agree with what you're saying. When you take the Bible out of the schools, when you take the Bible out of the churches, 
when you take the Bible out of the knowledge of the people, the Word of God out of the knowledge and remembrance of the people, and you put before them every other crisis, every other science, every other art, every other liberal art, every other concern, you entertain them until they are entertained to fat and laziness, you can do whatever you want with them. Give them what they want, and they'll follow you right off the cliff. We're too comfortable in this country. Yes, there's a saying, if you want to destroy somebody, just give them all they want. Yeah. Yeah, and as we talk about this infiltration from the Roman Catholic Church, I know we are already an hour and 15 in the broadcast, and we actually start, we, we, we wanted to do something else, but I said already in the beginning that I wanted to re, uh, reiterate the quotes that we uh, ended our last broadcast with and uh, taken from Charles Chinnicky from the 50 years in the Church of Rome. And I think these few quotes that I'm going to read uh, right now, and then we will analyze them a little bit because we are already, or Tom did already uh, analyze these quotes last week into depth, but uh, still you can do a little bit today. Um, I think this is something that we should round up and uh, also in that way we have the possibility to get through the whole quotes in this email here. I think this will take maybe half an hour altogether. So when it's all right with you two brothers, I would really like to start this few quotes starting with Charles Chenequi from 50 Years in the Church of Rome. Is that okay with you? Certainly, certainly. <clears throat> yeah, Walt, you? Okay? Sure, sure. Okay, thanks. I'm going, to start, <clears throat> I'm going to start with a quote from uh, Charles Chiniqui, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, page 373. Quote, we, meaning the Catholic Church, are determined to take possession of the United States and rule them. But we cannot do that without acting secretly and with utmost wisdom. If our plans become known, they will surely be defeated. End quote. Tom, you surely have a little bit to say about that, right? And I mean, Certainly. it's all yeah. something that we, all, all, it's already something that we covered already in the broadcast here, but still I think there's uh, something very eloquent that you can uh, take to elaborate this text a little bit more. Certainly, if Protestants in this country had ever become aware of the Vatican's design for this country, there would have been war in the streets. We would have had a return to the, 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 the wars of England, religious wars. When the papacy got control of the king, then Protestants were persecuted. When a Protestant came to the throne, then Roman Catholics were suppressed. The Jesuits were kicked out of the country. And, and the Vatican was... was unable to wrestle England back into her fold because of the Protestant influence in the country. And Rome made a special effort when this country began to flourish to make sure that what had occurred in England was not repeated in this country. That if they ever... If they, if they ever hoped to gain control of this country and make it a vassal of the Holy See, they had to do it clandestinely. They had to do it secretly. They could never let their plans be made public. And yet here is Charles Chinnicky, a Roman Catholic priest who was gloriously reformed, spilling the beans. And he wasn't the only one. cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church have warned the United States what they intended to do. Eventually, through immigration, through silently, carefully, cautiously gaining in numbers, gaining in power and strength and influence, and particularly by gaining control of the political offices in our country, federal, state, county, and even local governments, little by little, through the civil laws of the land, they could make this country Catholic. That was their ultimate long-term goal. And it was reiterated by many other, even Roman Catholic cardinals of this country, 
got loose with their lips and boastful and proud and began to talk about their strategy. It was known in this country and it's from the 1800s on back, but not in the 19th, 1900s and 2000s. Not a word of it is said, and if anybody brings it up, they're regarded as anti-Roman Catholic bigots for crying out loud. But Rome is now so far along in her strategy to Catholicize the United States of America, especially after Vatican Council II in the 1960s, that they're not even careful to conceal their plan. And... uh, I'll tell you all the fears that were expressed by the Protestant authors of the 17th and 18th century have, have literally come to pass. And Charles Chenicky was just one of them Roman Catholic priests of the 18th or 17th century, or rather, the 1800s, the mid 1800s, who exposed Rome's long-term strategy for the United States of America. And here we see the Pope of Rome. Scheduled for September of this this year, this fall, to come and speak to our legislature, a joint session of Congress. That would never have been permitted in the 1800s. There was a bit of Protestantism left in this country. This man of sin, this one, this self-styled King of Kings and Lord of Lords, would never be allowed to set foot on this turf, much less enter the gates, enter the doors of our legislative body, of our civil government, because they all remembered that in the old world order, the papacy can control all the governments of Europe through the legislatures, through the king. It all rang, it would all have rung way too familiar for them. But now the papacy is bold, especially after Vatican Council II especially after futurism has done its damage and everyone has forgot who the man of sin is and looking for a future one. The Pope, the Antichrist, the man of sin is now free to even come not only to the White House, but to Congress, that which is supposed to represent the people of this country. Well, to the papacy, the people of this country are Roman Catholic. Even though they call themselves Protestants and Lutherans, they're Roman Catholic because they have Roman Catholic belief. They no longer believe the papacy is the Antichrist. uh, Look, look, we've lost the war. If Christ doesn't stand up, if, if a remnant of Christ's people do not stand up and protest this pope's uh, uh, control over this country, we're doomed. And we literally get what we deserve. Now, many people might find that offensive, but look, if you worship Baal, you, you, you provoke the wrath of Almighty God. History is about to repeat itself. Biblical history is about to repeat itself. All because we've lost our Protestant heritage. Mm-hmm. Charles Chinnicky was just one of many Roman Catholics of his era who was plain and open about their strategy for this country. Yeah, and talking about strategy, Tom, there's also another interesting point when you just think of the financial system. Certainly. After the founding of the United States of America, the Vatican tried three times to establish a central bank. Mm-hmm. You had the first American bank, then you had the second American bank. I think, I think that one was slashed by John Adams. Was it John Adams? Who has on the tombstone written, I... Uh, I uh, I killed the banks. I believe that's true. I, I, I think that was him, if I'm not mistaken. And then, and then we come to 1913, and we come to the monster of Jekyll Island, and we come to the Federal Reserve Bank that everybody thinks is owned by the Jews. What a joke is that when you look behind it, it's all owned by the Knights of Malta. It's all owned by the Jesuits, which are the Roman Catholic Church. And there they had the foundation they needed to finance the next 30-year war between 1914 and 1945. 
the First and Second World War. And right. what did they do in that time? They took the Protestant American soldiers and let them fight against Protestant German and uh, together with Protestant English against Protestant German soldiers in World War I and in World War II. The Vatican right. very, very smartly let his own enemies destroy themselves. Yes. And financing it with a phony financial system that two times in the United States of America has been fought against and had only, uh, had only a, uh, how do you say that, uh, a duration of, I think, 20 to 25 years. And then it was re-seen for the first bank of America and for the second bank of America. And they didn't succeed in that and they needed that. And that's why in 1913 came the... Uh, founding of the Federal Reserve, which is as federal as Federal Express, and before that, even the, you have and I love Bill Hughes for that in his Secret Terrorist book that he wrote uh, about the sinking of the Titanic. When you just read that chapter, your eyes will go open wide, and you see the deception that Charles Chinicky is talking about that the Roman Catholic Church needs to infiltrate the former Protestant uh, colonies in the United States of America. Yep. yep. Now the Revolutionary War makes sense. They had to separate the colonies from Protestant England. They had to separate the United States from the religious conflict between Protestantism and Catholicism. And then they had to be careful when they came here to slowly take over the country without raising Protestant protests, and they were very successful. The Federal Reserve Bank is a Jesuit bank, and, uh, you know, I, I know the listeners out there are rolling their eyes at well, how Where do you come up with that, Tom? Look, there's a woman in the World Bank right now. Her name is Karen Hudes, H-U-D-E-S, Karen Hudes. Yeah. She was chief legal counsel for the World Bank, and she uncovered some corruption at the World Bank, and she also discovered a cover-up. And she and many of her colleagues were aware of this, and they began to do their own research. They began to do their own investigations. And Karen Hudis is now on record. You can go to Google Videos and watch her videos. Just type in her name, Karen common spelling, K-A-R-E-N, Hudes, H-U-D-E-S. And she'll tell you flat out, the Roman Catholic Church is in control. She discovered this on her own, that the, that the, the Federal Reserve Bank is owned by the Jesuits. And that, she says this in one of her videos, I'll quote it as nearly as I can, she said that 60% of the money that we pay in IRS taxes, Internal Revenue Service, which is the ones who are supposed to collect all the money to pay back this Jesuit bank called the Federal Reserve Bank, 60% of the money that we pay to the IRS goes directly to the Jesuit order. <coughs> Excuse me. That's right, but there's also another point that you always say when you mention Karen Yudas because... Uh, she is not just a whistleblower, uh, because if she just was a whistleblower and discovering all these secrets, she probably would be dead by now. But she is sent out there with her own agenda. What is her agenda, Tom? Well, as near as I can tell, what she wants to solve this problem is a, a, a constitutional Congress. In other words, put the Constitution of the United States on the table for negotiation. And you know what Rome intends to do with that. Oh, yeah. That's why already in the United States, States Supreme Court, there are six Roman Catholics and three Jews. Yeah. There is not one Protestant there. Now, you can say, what does that concern me, the United States Supreme Court? I don't care what they do. No. The United States Supreme Court, and even I as a European know that, is that to interpret the United States Constitution. 
Yeah. So what do you think when even we say this constitution is a Protestant paper, which is not, but even if it was, what do you think happened to a Protestant paper that is being interpreted by Roman Catholics? That's right. And what we have is this small group of judges on the Supreme Court are being expected to literally overturn the Constitution all by themselves. And we know the Constitution's being destroyed. Look at the Patriot Act, the NDAA, all these other unconstitutional laws that have been passed in Congress. And it was the Supreme Court's jo job to stand up and say, no, this violates the Constitution. But they didn't. The yeah, Roman the Catholics on the, on the Supreme Court did not rule those laws, which are not laws, as unconstitutional. So the, so the Supreme Court is serving the papacy, Congress is supporting the papacy, the presidency is supporting the papacy, and what is their goal? To tear down and destroy the Constitution. Now, if that is their goal, what better strategy to do that than to, than to bring the United States to a crisis and then have a, a constitutional Congress to literally put the entire Constitution on the table for renegotiation, for re you know. To, for rewriting, reconsideration. I mean, there's no protest in this country. <laughs> Nobody knows what Rome's strategy is. Nobody exactly. sees this coming. But it's as plain as the nose on your face. And Karen Yudas let the cat out of the bag, and she would know. She is in it a is, position to know. Uh, sorry, I, I, I just have to say that this is just another way of the typical Hegelian dialectic. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Yep. This is exactly what she's doing. And that is what their way always is. Here's the problem. There is the other problem. Let's fuse these two and come together to our synthesis. And what's the synthesis? Or well, maybe a gold and silver based currency. But who owns all the gold and silver in the world? Interesting you bring this up. The, <laughs> what it amounts to is the Jesuit bank prints phony money, and they take gold as collateral against the debt. Now, if the, can Jesuits own, if, if, the yeah, Jesuits own, if the Jesuits own the Federal Reserve Bank, then you've got to know the Jesuits own the gold that was taken as a hedge against the debt. So that Rome is, owns all the gold. That's also very interesting to go back to the founding of the Federal Reserve Bank because when I saw this video one some years ago with Eustace Mullins uh, going on the on the contract that were made there, uh, there was mentioning that the deposit that was made by the initial uh, stockholders of the um, of the Federal Reserve, which were uh, J.P. Morgan and then Schiff and I don't know all these guys, all uh, all Rothschild agents and Rothschild, of course, Knight of Malta, Jesuit controlled. Um, they were told to put a, a certain amount of money, a certain amount of of, of, uh, of money to deposit in the Federal Reserve for starting the Federal Reserve up. And the only one who put in real gold was the United States government, and all they did was putting in paper money. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so fake from the beginning, and you can read all this. Just go through, um, read the book, uh, The Monster of Jekyll Island, or what is it called? The, Something the like that. From Jekyll Island. The creature, creature from Jekyll, Jekyll Island. Island. Yeah. Yes. yeah, okay, creature, monster, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> the beast. From Jekyll yeah. Island is what I would call oh, that's, it. That's even better, Tom. Yeah, the that's Roman beast from Jekyll Island in disguise. Yes, in disguise. In very good disguise. Come on, I, I want to read the next. I want to read the next quote from Charles Chinnicky. Sure. From the same book. Rome is in constant conspiracy against the rights and liberties of men all over the world, but she's particularly so in the United States. Long before I was ordained a priest, I knew that my church was the most implacable enemy of this republic. My professors of philosophy, history, and theology, keep in mind what he studied, philosophy, history, and theology, have been anonymous in telling me that the principles and laws of the Church of Rome were absolutely antagonistic to the laws and principles 
that are the foundation stones of the Constitution of the United States. End quote. Yep. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> the Charles Chinnicky knew as well as the Protestants in this land that the Constitution, by the way it was written, the way it was worded, especially the Bill of Rights, made it certain that the papacy could never control this country. That it would be a government of, by, and for the people, not of, by, and for the Pope. And we had liberty to speak against the, the king and the pope. So, so it had built-in anti-papal hedge uh, protections so that the old world order could not be restored in this country. It was, it was, it was a Protestant purpose behind all of that. And Charles Chinnicky is right. Their goal was to overthrow this, this constitution. The constitution guaranteed the Protestant liberty to rebel against the Antichrist. And this is confirmed by Pope Pius IX. Pope Pius IX wrote his Syllabus of Error of 1864, damning every tenet of our Constitution. It went right down the line. No freedom of speech. No, It's an error to believe that a man should be free to speak. You know, it is an error to believe that government should be of, by, and for the people when God has placed a man on this earth to rule over his people, the Pope of Rome. That's essentially what it says. Read it for yourself. It's online. You can read it for yourself. The Syllabus of Error of 1864 by Pope, rather, Antichrist, Pope Pius IX. Well, you know, and then his successor, Leo XIII, confirmed all of it. And they were both tutored by the Jesuits. So Rome's agenda is really not very well concealed. And, and what we're seeing today are just simply facts on the ground confirming Rome's agenda for this country. And their control of the Federal Reserve Bank has just got a financial stranglehold. Listen, let me put it in terms that even a simple-minded man can understand. The entire debt of the United States, every red cent owned or owed by the people of this country, so to the tune, I've heard figures uh, close to $29 trillion, a debt that we could never pay, is owed to the Vatican. That's not an overstatement. That's reality. The entire debt of this country is owed to none else but the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the Bible. The United States is in a desperate spiritual condition, a desperate temporal condition, because well, Rome... That's, that's why when the Pope first came over, he kissed the ground when he came off the plane, that's right? That's right. He owns it, <laughs> lock, stock, and barrel. Lock, stock, he and owns barrel. it. He's taken all the gold and collateral for the debt, and he owns the ground, too. And now he owns the, the souls of men, the people of this country. That's why he can come and speak to our legislator, our legislature and dictate what this government will do. And he speaks on behalf of the American people. That That's what he says. That is the biggest atrocity of it all. On yeah. behalf of the American people. And he they don't even me. stand up and they don't even stand up and say, no, you do not speak on my behalf. Yeah. Where's the protest? That is the protest that is to be looked for over there in the United States. Yeah. Because, let, let, let's face it, the United States is the last Protestant stronghold anywhere in the earth that we have. If there's any protest, it should come from there. Because Europe, here where I live, they have given up totally. They are 100% bound. And again, I don't Europe mean to be repetitious. But, but, look, but look, there's no protest here. Because now we don't believe the papacy is the Antichrist. We don't believe what the Protestant reformers were unanimous about. We believe in a future Antichrist, a single individual that comes in the last seven years before Christ returned. You see how they destroyed us? All they had to do was get our eyes off the papacy. And now he can come waltzing into this country right through the halls of the most powerful government in the world, that government that represents the people, and he says now that he speaks for us. 
oh, what a horror this is. And I don't mean to seem melodramatic to people. It is literally a crisis situation, a spiritual crisis. Look, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back for this country. Yeah, that goes very well with the next quote from Charles Chinnickley from the same book. The American people must be very blind indeed if they do not see that if they do nothing to prevent it. The day is very near when the Jesuits will rule their country from the magnificent White House as Washington to the humblest civil and military department of this vast republic, end quote. This has absolutely been fulfilled and surely will be fulfilled for everybody to see when on the 24th of September 2015, the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist, Pope Francis I, comes over to the United States of America to speak on a joint session of Congress on behalf of the American people. He can only do that because the people are very blind. And let me say this one. Otherwise, they say I'm bashing Americans. It's not your fault 100%. You have been dumped down through the educational and through the indoctrination system, through Hollywood, through your schools, your public school system, through the universities, through everything that you have from cradle to grave. You have been indoctrinated not to question authority, not to question anything that has been stated in front of you, but just to, just to take another spoon of it and suck it up. It's not your fault at all because I, here in Europe, I cannot speak freely of the people here. They, they have just, I mean, the, the system is all over the world. It's, it's the same. But you have at least for the moment now the possibilities to listen to broadcasts like this and take up the quotes that we give you and get the books yourself and read it and educate yourself and educate your family and educate your friends and warn them what's going to come. Comment. Please, Walt. Uh, <clears throat> you're talking about, you mentioned dubbing down. I like to quote Rulers of Evil, author Tupper Saucy, chapter 9, page 74. America's understanding has been systematically bent to the will of the church militant, while the intellectual means for sensing the capture have been disconnected. While the intellectual means for sensing the capture have been disconnected. Most of the content of modern media, whether television, radio, print, film, stage, or web, is a state-of-the-art Jesuit ratio studiorum. The Jesuit college is no longer just a chartered institution. It has become our entire social environment. The movies, the mall, the school, the home, the mind. Human experience has become a spiritual exercise managed by the charismatic spiritual directors who now know how to manipulate a democracy's emotions. Logic, perspective, national memory, and self-discipline are purged to the point that unbridled emotional responses, as economist Thomas Sowell put it, Sowell put it are all we have left. I think that sums up the dubbing down of America. It certainly does. It certainly does. There's a book from um, this uh, woman, uh, I don't know her first name anymore, Eiserbeit. And uh, you can get that online, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America, something like that it's called. It's very interesting to read, and it will give you a very good view of how... Yeah, of course, again, we say the American people, but you can say that works for all the people all over the world, have been dumbed down not to to look at their enemy. I have another quote here that comes from Marcus Cicero. And um, at the Roman Senate, he made that quote that goes as follows. A nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious but it cannot survive treason from within. 
An enemy at the gates is less formidable, for he is known and carries his banners openly against the city. But the traitor moves among those within the gates freely, his sly whispers rustling through the, all the alleys, heard in the very halls of government itself. For the traitor appears no traitor. He speaks in the accents familiar to his victims, and he wears their face and their garments, and he appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men. He rots the soul of a nation. He works secretly and unknown in the night to undermine the pillars of a city. He infects the body politic so that it can no longer resist. End quote. Marcus Cicero here is stating everything that the so-called society of Jesus is all about. But Tom, please give me your comment. Yes, that was a Roman from the pagan Roman Empire telling us how to overthrow a government through treason, silent infiltration, wearing the garb and speaking the language of their victims, moving about within the land freely and slowly poisoning the country like a cancer. That's how the Jesuits operate for the church militant. And uh, nowhere in the world have the Jesuits been more successful at infiltration than the United States of America. They have been kicked out of virtually every country in the world where they set up their system. Every government of the world that ever allowed the Jesuits upon their soil eventually regretted it and kicked them out with extreme prejudice for their political intrigue, for inciting wars and religious, religious contention and persecuting Protestants. What is different about the United States of America? Why has the United States of America never lifted one single solitary voice of protest against these militia for the Pope? Why are they the spiritual advisors in the halls of Congress as chaplain dealing with the moral issues of every legislator? Did you know that the, the chief... Uh, Spiritual guide for our Congress is a Jesuit priest. What, 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 where is the sense? This country that is so proud of its, of its intellect, of its industry, of its affluence, is so devoid of any knowledge of history that they would see nothing wrong with a Jesuit becoming the spiritual advisor of our legislators in Congress, much less that a pope would come and speak to them on behalf of the American people. Anyone who does even a modicum of, of investigation and research into the history of the Jesuit order can tell you they must be uh, a rogue group indeed if they have been reviled by every nation on the planet except the United States of America. Not one voice of protest has ever been raised against the Jesuits who own colleges and universities and schools and high schools throughout this country indoctrinating their students with Jesuit education, spiritual exercises, so that they might leave their, their colleges and go out into our society and occupy the most powerful positions in our government and law enforcement and banking and education and the press, poisoning this land ever so slowly for the eventual overthrow of Protestantism in this country. I mean, you, you simply can't make up this stuff. This is the stuff of history. 
This is confirmed in a whole library of books. I'm looking at them right now. I've got nearly 400 books in my library written by Protestants, written by Roman Catholics warning this country what would happen if we failed to kick the Jesuits out of this country, if we failed to stop their agenda. Charles Jenneke was just one of them. And there should be no question in anybody's mind who really, <clears throat> who really runs this country. The same ones who ruled France until they were kicked out. The same ones who ruled Portugal until they were kicked out. The same ones who ruled Italy. The very shadow of the walls of the Vatican were kicked out of Italy. All the nations of Europe, they were kicked out of Japan. You can't name another nation on the his, in the history of the world that never kicked out the Jesuits at least once. But they're free to operate. They've been free to operate in this country ever since before the Revolutionary War. It's, it's just, it's, it's impossible to conceive that this land once regarded as Protestant would have no protest against a Jesuit roaming up and down the halls of Congress, advising our legislators, advising our, pre our, pro our, our presidents, controlling our banks, controlling our education system, sitting on the board of directors of the largest, most powerful, most influential corporations, advising the military-industrial complex of this country, controlling the Federal Reserve Bank, I mean, what words fail me? Words literally fail me, Yerk. I understand. I would like to say, save your breath a little, because there's another quote coming from Project Vatican. And after this little quote, I'm going on to read a little bit, and then we can analyze that all together to come down to the end of the show afterwards, if that's all right with you. The quote from Project Vatican goes as follows. The Protestant's lack of a governing authority has resulted in a sheep-like obedience to civil governments. Such, such social compliance, coupled with capitalistic greed, has made Christian fundamentalists extremely vulnerable to social engineering. Now, having failed to divide the United States into two nations, the Jesuits resorted to Plan B, talking about the Civil War, of course. Plan B was to be a multi-prolonged, long-term, deeply devious and traitorous enterprise. The Jesuits were and are the epitome of Caesar's traitors within the gates, as I mentioned before. The scheme for the overthrow of the United States was to operate on many levels and would transform the very structure of the American Republic and even transform the people themselves through social engineering. In the aftermath of the Civil War, the American people were still very anti-Catholic. The vast majority of them were Protestants, and they were very well versed in Catholic Protestant history at that time. The Jesuits set out to change the anti-Catholic attitude of the Americans, and they did it through social engineering. In order to demonstrate how they did this, we will examine just one part of the social engineering program, the media, and in this instance, just one part of the media, the movie industry. Daryl F. Zenak and Joseph Schenk, the founders of the Hollywood movie studio 20th Century Fox, got their business established in 1930 with a $3 million loan from Bank of America, formerly known as the Bank of Italy, supposedly founded by Amadeo Pietri Giannini, the son of Italian immigrants, but generally considered to be owned by the Jesuits and the Vatican. This assertion that the finance for the movie industry's most successful studio came from a Jesuit Vatican-controlled bank is supposed by, uh, supported by the movies they made, which were designed to socially engineer the American public by exalting Catholicism and degenerating American and Christian principles. And now follow a few examples. 
For example, number one, Gone with the Wind from 1939, a movie where the Confederate soldiers are the heroes and the Northerners are the villains. It was the highest grossing film until the 1960s. From 1960, then, we have Inherent the, Inherit the Wind, based on the 1926 Scopes Money Trial, the movie denigrated Christianity and creationism and exalted evolution. The next movie is Elmer Gantry, a movie about a drunken Christian traveling, traveling salesman who seduces a physic female tent evangelist. At the end of the movie, Elmer Gantry finds salvation in the Catholic Church. Now comes a movie everybody knows, The Sound of Music. Many people's favorite movie of all time, also the highest grossing movie of all time, supplanting even Gone with the Wind. Most moviegoers would have no idea that when watching this movie, they were watching Catholic propaganda. The heroes of the movie are the happy, jolly nuns who saved the von Trapp family from the evil Nazis. This myth is particularly obnoxious because the exact opposite is true. After the Nazis lost World War II, the Catholic Church used their nunneries and their monasteries to hide Nazi war criminals and spirit them off to, refugee, to refugees in South, Africa, uh, South America and the United States. The United States took the Nazis that were useful to them, such as rocket scientists. This Catholic clandestine network was and is known as the Vatican Red Lines. Then further on, you have all these so-called Western movies, where so-called real men went to the saloon, got drunk, fought with fists and guns, and never went to church. In addition, whenever the script for a modern movie or TV program requires a wedding or a funeral scene, it will almost always be in a Catholic church. Whenever a script requires a religious bigot, it is almost always a Protestant or some other religion, but never a Catholic. One major exception was the Godfather series. This movies, <clears throat> these movies did not portray the Catholic Church in a positive light. In fact, the series was a semi-accurate portrayal of the close connections between the Catholic Church and the Mafia, both of them profiting from the other. The purpose of the Mafia is to terrorize the Catholic population and keep, keep them under control. The famous FBI maestro J. Edgar Hoover, for most of his law enforcement career, always denied that there was such a thing as organized crime, i.e. the Mafia did not exist. Who was he working for? <laughs> I guess Tom will answer that a little bit later for us. Have the Jesuits and the Catholic Church been successful in socially engineering a change in attitude towards Catholicism in America? Yes, they have. After the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, there was enough recognition of the role of the Jesuits in the assassination, and there was enough fortitude on the part of the American government to break off diplomatic relations with the Vatican in 1867. Quote, this decision, the breaking of diplomatic relations, was based on mounting on anti-Catholic sentiment fueled by the conviction and hanging of Mary Surratt, a Catholic, for taking part in the conspiracy to assassinate President Abraham Lincoln. This quote is taken from Wikipedia, article of the Holy See, United States Relations. This diplomatic divorce lasted until serious efforts began to be made under President Harry Truman to restore relations. In 1951, Truman nominated former General Mark W. Clark to be the United States emissary to the Holy See. But the Protestants were still Protestants. They rose up and demanded that the diplomatic divorce would remain in place. Truman and the Vatican had to back off and drop the proposal. However, just listen, 33 years later, President Ronald Reagan proposed the same thing and this time it was evident that the Protestants had lost their Protestantism, or Protestantism was no longer strong enough to prevent it. The Jesuits had their foot in the door. All they had to do now was to push it open. Note, the official statement used at the restoration of diplomatic relations reads thus, quote, The United States of America and the Holy See 
and the desire to further promote the existing mutual friendly relations have decided by common agreement to establish diplomatic relations between them at the level of embassy on the part of the United States of America and nunciature, that means Catholic Church office at embassy level, on the part of the Holy See as of today, January 10th, 1984. End quote. Of course, the change of attitude that enabled the re-establishment of diplomatic relations was not achieved by the movie industry alone. Social engineering is a constant factor in all areas of society, but especially in the media and in education. The media side of social engineering used to be called propaganda. That term is now offensive. Now it is preferred to use the euphemistic term public relations. And I end the quote right here. And when you think about what is mentioned about the media and propaganda, think of all the social networks. Everybody today has a so-called smartphone or iPhone and is constantly connected to the Internet and constantly connected to television channels, to movie watching, wherever you are, and all this stuff. Isn't that social engineering to you? Well, Tom, I look very much forward to your remarks on this, sorry, a little bit lengthy, but very interesting reading that I just gave. So please give us your thoughts, Tom. Yes, well, they've taken over the press and uh, entertainment. You mentioned the most popular movies in the history of American uh, filmmaking, and uh, they either promote Roman Catholicism and praise Roman Catholicism, or they discount Christianity. And both serve Rome. And as far as the, the, the recount of the history of the development and reestablishment of formal diplomatic relations with the Holy See of Rome through the film industry, through people like Ronald Reagan, all of it is confirmed in this book that I just finished reading by Roman Catholic ambassador to the Holy See, U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, in his book, The Global Vatican. I highly encourage the listeners to get a copy of this book and see from a Roman Catholic mouth yourself what role the CIA, the State Department, the ambassadorship, see what they all have in common. See what Ronald Reagan had in common with the papacy. Truman first attempted to establish formal diplomatic relations, but the Protestants put a stop to it. The question we have to ask is, why did the Protestants put a stop to formal diplomatic relations? Because they had not yet forgotten their Protestant heritage. They had not yet forgotten who the Antichrist was. They obviously didn't believe in futurism. They were still historicists in their beliefs and saw throughout history the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the antichrist, the papacy. But that all died after futurism caught its hold. That paved the way for all the propaganda that came from Hollywood, all of the Roman Catholic, all of the Jesuit propaganda and social engineering that we were fed day and night. Now it's on our televisions every night. My wife still watches television against my best advice. And when I walk through the room and that television's going, I always see a crucifix hanging on the wall you know, on the television or some other solar blaze or some other, some other uh, Roman Catholic icon. The propaganda is wall to wall. It's day and night. And nobody's aware of it in this country. Very few are aware of, of the Roman agenda for this country. Our government is completely incriminated for its alliance with the man of sin. It is wholly corrupt. We could never expect anything righteous to come out of Washington, D.C. because of its unholy relationship with the man of sin. And Hollywood's propagandizing us for generations. 
the newspapers, the radio broadcasts, they all work together. You know, you can walk the, uh, walk up to the common American on the street. What do you think of the press? Do you think it's controlled? Yeah, I think it's controlled. Who do you think controls it? They don't have a clue. Well, we have a clue. Well, they have a clue. They always say it's the Jews. Yeah, yeah, the Jews. Which God said, if they did not obey him, they would be the tail of the nations and not the head. That's what God said. So what power do you think the Jews really have? The disobedient, Christ-rejecting Jews, are they the head of the nations? Do they control things? Or are they the tail of the nations, like God said? Well, according to the New Testament, we are living in the time of the Gentiles. That's right. And when you talk about the Jews who have power, you have to consider the term court Jews, or yeah. as it comes from the German original Hofjuden, meaning the Jews that were at the court of the kings at that time, and still are at the court of the uh, secular power, the temporal power of this world. And all of these court Jews are organized in Vatican knighthoods, whether it be knights of Malta or any other knighthood they are organized in those, like, for example, the Rothschilds, who, what you can read in Rulers of Evil, uh, I think it's about page 160 about there somewhere, that it is stated in the um, Encyclopedia Britannica, I think it was. Or, no, no, the Encyclopedia it, 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 Judaica, the it's Jewish Judaica. Encyclopedia. Yes, exactly, I was just, uh, yes. just uh, getting to that. Yeah, I was, I was wrong there. The, the Encyclopedia Judaica, they are mentioned there as the guardians of the Vatican treasure. So, yes. is the guardian the owner? Is he the one that uh, can dispose of all the money? Is he the one that can do with it what he can do? Or is he just there to guard it and to collect it and to guard it for whom? Is something you have to ask yourself. I think this is something that we quite made clear uh, during this broadcast when you listened a little bit about the thing about the first and second American bank and of course the Federal Reserve Bank that we have right now who are really the owners of that which is the Vatican therefore they are the treasury and the they Rothschilds, are the Rothschilds are Vatican agents they were trained in Louis Lycée Legrand uh, Lycée Louis Le Grand in France, a Jesuit university. They became they became experts at finance and banking, and the Vatican simply uses them to control the the, the banks. And uh, of course, everyone just stops short of, of of full looking into the situation when they find out that, that the Rothschilds are Jews. But that's not all. They're also Freemasons, which is controlled by the Jesuit order. They were educated by the Jesuits. They were put in power by the Jesuits. They are financed by the Vatican. It's the Vatican's money that they handle. And I, I literally, you know, I read this in, in Rulers of Evil, page 160, where F. Tupper Saucy calls them the, the, the guardians of the papal treasure. And I, I, I have to check this out. So I yeah, you know that, that I, the name yeah. comes from Maya Amschel Rothschild und Söhne, yep. M A R S. They have the Red Shield, which is which is the German name for Rothschild, the Red Shield. Mars being the uh, the planet of war and the god of war in the pagan Roman Empire, and the Roman soldiers wore red shields to defend yep. themselves when they went into war. This is the soldiery of the Vatican. Yes. <laughs> yes. This is a great, great book. <laughs> yes, it really is. And I looked it up in the Encyclopedia Judaica, the Jewish Encyclopedia. It's free online under Rothschilds. And I read and read and read until I came to the very quote that F. Tupper Saucy used to describe the Rothschilds. Guardians of the Papal Treasure. Look it up yourself. That bank that is called a Federal Reserve Bank is a Rothschild-controlled 
Jesuit bank. And the debt that we, the American people, owe to that bank is owed to the Vatican. That's just mind-boggling. Now you know why the Vatican's got so much power in our government. They own us lock, stock, and barrel. If you liquidated this country, it couldn't pay the debt that the Jesuits have rung up against us. That's why Rome has her way in this country. Rothschild once said, give me control of a nation's money, and I care not who makes its laws. Guess what? He got control of this nation's money, and he desperately needs to, uh, to assure who makes the laws of this country. They have to conform to Roman Catholic canon law. And again, I'll recommend the video for those who haven't yet seen it. A, Roman, a, a gloriously reformed and saved Roman Catholic priest who has come out of the Roman Catholic Church and has dedicated his life to telling the truth about the Vatican. He's one qualified to do so. His name is Richard Bennett. Richard Bennett, and his website is BereanBeacon.org. Berean, B-E-R-E-A-N, Beacon, B-E-A-C-O-N, dot O-R-G. BereanBeacon.org. And he's got many, many videos exposing Rome's control of this country. And one of them is entitled... Vatican control through civil law. And you must watch that video. Vatican control through civil law. And remember, Richard Bennett was a prelate at the university in the Vatican, Gregorian University. He served at the Vatican. He had, against Roman Catholic teaching, began to read his own Bible with his own eyes, and see it through God's eyes and not through the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church. And he was reading Revelation chapter 17, where it described a woman riding a beast with a golden cup in her hand, decked in scarlet and, 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 and purple, and adorned in, in, in uh, gold and silver and precious stones and pearls. And about that time, a conclave of priests and bishops and, and cardinals was was excused from session, and they filled Vatican Square with red and purple. And all of a sudden, God opened his eyes. He was serving that woman that rides a scarlet-colored beast of Revelation chapter 17. He knew straight from the portals of glory that God was telling him a message Come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Richard Bennett was full well aware of all the corruption in the Roman Catholic Church, but he had believed all of his life from cradle to grave that the Roman Catholic Church is the one holy Roman Catholic and apostolic church outside of which there is no salvation. But he left, and he's never looked back. And now he's more Protestant than any Protestant I ever knew. And he's exposing Vatican control through civil law. And not only that, Tom, but he also was the reason for our first four broadcasts that we did on his paper where he analyzed the joint declaration of justification, yes. the Catholic Lutheran accord that the Roman Catholic Church made with the Worldwide uh, Lutheran uh, Federation in 1999, <clears throat> where then later in 2014 uh, that video came out from Kenneth Copeland Ministries, where his bishop Tony Palmer stated, "The protest is over," and yes. this is exactly what we are talking all through this broadcast today. Tom, I want to thank you very much. I want to bring this now to an end because we have exhausted uh, more than two hours about this, but I could go on for hours anymore. I just want to tell our listeners we had something else planned today uh, on the broadcast, but because Tom arrived late, we uh, took another route. And I only want to tell you that everything that was said here today has not been prepared by us. Everything we said, we just looked up as we went along and 
it was the Holy Spirit that gave these words to Tom, that gave his words to uh, Walt, and probably also a little bit to me by reading all the quotes that we did, and with that we did a show of more than two hours. I want to thank our listeners for listening. I want to thank Tom Fress for his wonderful contribution that he did on this on this show. I think I will never be able to make a good show without you, Tom, and I'm very grateful for that. Also, Walt, maybe you have some closing remarks on that? No, Walt no, went... No, no well, yeah. I, I think that... Uh, it uh, the broadcast uh, flowed right flowed and connected and i think we connected a lot of dots and the one thing i have to say if uh, is to share this in other words we don't we you know we don't have any sponsors we're speaking right from the heart where god instructs us to worship in spirit and truth so i just uh, strongly urge it if you if you've been blessed by this message, to share it with others. That's right, Walt. I don't have any uh, many much to add to that, but uh, is there a closing remark that you want to say, Tom? Yes, I always close with this very, very important salutation. Blessings in the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Christ, the Lamb of God. There is no future Antichrist. Antichrist is historical. He has plagued God's people for nearly 2,000 years. And he's coming back to power. They've destroyed the Protestant Reformation. The new world order is simply the old world order restored, and none of it would be possible if we understood that Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27 is not speaking about an antichrist. It's talking about Jesus Christ himself. He was the one in the midst of the week who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease when he gave up his life and God ripped the veil of the temple. That destroys your futurist belief in a future antichrist. You must now comprehend, as did all the Protestant reformers, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the man of sin the little horn, the son of perdition, the Judas priest, the Antichrist of the Bible. You must restore your Protestant heritage, and you must join in the war that was begun in heaven and will not end until Christ's return. Peace be upon you. When the Prince of Peace comes, until then there will be nothing but persecution for God's people unless you choose to sit on the bench and surrender your faith. Thanks, Yerk. Praise the Lord, Tom. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you very much, Walt, for setting this call up. I will now close the, the, this broadcast by reading once again the motto of our show that will probably, even after this broadcast, make a little bit more sense to you. They used to call us heretics, and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send out their crusades. Times and methods may have changed. The goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible-believing people who uphold the truth in Jesus Christ's name and who are aware of the fact that Rome never changes. Thank you very much for listening in. I hope to see you next time with another broadcast, probably next week. Until then... God bless you and goodbye.